angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike you will not strike your foot against the stone Psalm 91 verses 13 through 16 verses 5 through 8. Psalm 91, verses 9 through 12. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you 
will not strike will not strike your foot against the stone. Verses five through eight. Good morning, everyone. Pastor Billy here. Just wanted to give a special greeting to those of you who are joining us online this morning. We're glad that you are with us. If this is your uh, first Sunday with us, we particularly welcome you. A couple of things to be aware of. Uh, first of all, uh, we send out a weekly email letting everyone know all that we have going on around the church. If you'd like to be added to that uh, email, you can find a link on our website or better yet, email us at office at cornerstonepca.com. Let us know you'd like to be uh, added to that weekly email. Uh, secondly, on our website in the upper right-hand corner, there's a link called Sunday Resources. It's here that we uh, uh, post digital versions of all the things that we make available in print for those who are in person. So we've got a digital version of the bulletin. We've got some resources connected with the sermon and outline discussion questions. Uh, the sermon blog is there. We've got resources for the children as well. So be sure to check that out. Upper right-hand corner corner of the website, cornerstonepca.com, under Sunday Resources. Uh, as you are watching on YouTube uh, this morning, we do encourage folks to sign in in the chat box. Let us know that you are uh, are here. Let us know where you're watching from. Always encouraging to know who's on the other side of the screen. And then uh, finally, just want to acknowledge that uh, the past couple of years certainly have been uh, a difficult time. Uh, your church wants to be here for, uh, for you. Please, reach out and uh, let us know uh, how myself, Pastor Dave, Tim, uh, one of our elders, one of our shepherding associates might be uh, helpful to you. All right, well, that's it. Let's get ready to worship. All right. 
Good morning. Very good. Hey, we're awake, even though we are very socially distanced this morning. My name is Billy Haynes, senior pastor here. Hey, who was at VBS this week? A few of us, all right. Uh, one of the largest VBSs we've ever done, over 260 students and 120-something volunteers. Thank you, church family. Yeah, that's something to celebrate. Uh, what an encouraging just picture of the church. It was so neat to see uh, all week just, you know, generation serving alongside generation, Jesus' name being lifted up. What an encouraging week. We've got, uh, we sent some, our high school students off to Peru uh, yesterday. I know that at least they landed in uh, Lima this morning on their way to their final destination. We're going to be sending off our middle school students later this afternoon to their mission trip. But we are here this morning to, uh, to worship. Let me introduce you to Pastor Dave, our associate pastor, who has our call to worship this morning. Good luck making your way through all these people, Dave. <laughs> no. Here we go. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. This has been an exciting week at BBS. Let's just take a moment as we come to worship the Lord to uh, uh, come and ask his blessing and for him to open our eyes this morning and then uh, close some prayer. Perfect God, our rock and our strong refuge, you are a shield for all those who take refuge in you. Remind us this morning of your grace and truth, your mercy and your justice, your strength and your humility, especially in sending us your perfect son, Jesus. Set our feet on this rock that never collapses. Accept our praises through Jesus, the one mediator, and his blood that covers our sins. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, three in one, as you open the sea for Moses and the Israelites, Remind us of your wonders in our lives and your power over all your and our enemies. Before we pray this. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to ask all the, all the kids and any teachers who learned our memory verse from VBS to stand up. And we're going to say it together uh, from 2 Samuel. 22, we're going to all say it out loud, so 31 to 33, this God, his way is perfect, the word of the Lord proves true, he is a shield for all those who take refuge in him, for who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge and has made my way blameless. All right, great job. You can have a seat. Yeah. We're going to sing about, we, we learned all about Moses and how the Lord uh, uh, saved the Israelites out of Egypt. And we get to sing about it with our first song this morning. So let's worship together. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Um, we'd ask you to please rise once again, and we're going to sing about our same God. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven <clears throat> over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Because we need to hear these words ourselves out loud, I'm going to ask that, uh, that we all recite this uh, prayer of thanksgiving together. Lord God, 
Let us never forget all that you do for us on a daily basis. Sustain us with the hope of our salvation and the other countless blessings you provide with your continuous presence in our lives. Lead us to live our life in testimony to your incredible blessings, that your love may be known and experienced by all of those who we serve. In Jesus' name, amen. It's running. 
be seated. How great is that? How cool is that to see uh, the church move forward in, in West Africa? Wow. Wow. To see people ordained into ministry and their families serving. That's just great. Um, my goodness. I'm Dave Spangler. I'm one of the elders here at Cornerstone. And uh, I'm here to uh, lead us in our time of congregational prayer. Um, there's a verse of scripture you're probably very familiar with. It goes like this. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And you know, um, I've been listening to a song where a songwriter has uh, rephrased that a little bit. And it goes like this. Purify my heart. May every word, every thought every motive, every intention be pleasing in your sight, O oh God. And it just cuts me to the heart. And, and so, so would you go to prayer with me? Father, we, we rejoice in, in your goodness to us that um, uh, we can speak of the goodness of God and we see it at work. And uh, we see it at work in West Africa, and we see it here in our midst. And we know it's only because of your grace. It's only because of your mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we look at our thoughts, words, motives, and intentions, honestly, we know how deeply we've sinned against you, how thoughtless we've been towards people in our family, at work, people who are made in God's image. Um, and we, we realize our, our status before you as dead and lost in our trespasses and sins unless you came to save us, and you have. That's where the goodness of the Lord comes from, that you died and you rose again to give us new life. And we rely on that fully. We rely on, we rely on that as your church, as you work in your church to, to uh, redeem a people for yourself, to redeem us for eternity and resting in that, and then progressively to grow in our thoughts, words, motives, and intentions. Lord, thank you. Father, we um, are mindful for all, all the ministries in your church that, that we can celebrate and we bring them before you at this time. We're thankful for the group headed to Peru, and we pray that you would give them uh, safe travel here and there. We pray that as they minister there, that, um, well, that they would learn as much from the people of God in, in Peru as they are able to serve and share. But we pray, we do pray that they would uh, work together as a team and share your grace and mercy and love with uh, with that group, and we count it a privilege to be uh, united with the global church in that way. Lord, we uh, thank you for the UTX team that's going to Camp Arrowhead, and we count it a privilege uh, as well that we can join in with uh, people with special needs and bless them and reach out to them in the name of Jesus. And we count it a joy and a blessing that we are partnered with uh, the Weavers, and we. We do rejoice in the churches that, that are being planted, the, the men who are receiving the call to ministry and their wives and families walking with them uh, for the church uh, a, a parent and, and moving forward in, in a, a difficult part of the world. Thank you for the weavers and their ministry. Care for them as they're here at home. Uh, give them refreshment and help them to care for the needs, their own needs and the needs of their family. Uh, Lord, um, here we, we pray for uh, the young adults in our congregation, maybe who are home and uh, don't have a, a place to connect. We pray that they might connect in the lunches that happen after church. 
We pray for uh, people here and there in our, in our congregation who are a little disconnected, that they would feel connected to you and our body and that we would be mindful of them as, as your people here. Lord, we, we pray for the hers daughter, Lauren, with a brain tumor, and we pray that you would camp around the hers and, and Lauren and her, her husband and family and give them peace and grace. And Lord, we, we pray you'll be with uh, Greg Baker and his siblings and Sandy and uh, his family as they grieve the loss of, of his mom. We rejoice that uh, she was cognizant to share um, that she believed in the Lord Jesus as she passed. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for uh, those who've lost loved ones. We, we remember um, Bob Clement, um, uh, the Sutton family, um, the Byers family, Ernie Boys. Um, all these people we lift up to you, Lord, that, that they would know your presence, that you would attend to them in their time of need, and, and you would be gracious to them. Lord, um, for unspoken requests that people haven't shared, I pray that this would be a place at Cornerstone where we could do ministry and life together and that we could know and share and support one another. But those being unspoken right now, I pray that you would minister wherever, wherever people are hurting silently, that you would uh, minister to them and, and our words and our motives and intentions would be to, su to give them support and, and heal them. Father, uh, we, we pray that as uh, Billy comes and shares your word that you would indeed teach us, that we would be mindful of, of uh, the living word of God that has been given to us, that teaches us to know who we are, that we belong to you. And, uh, we pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, so I don't know if there's junior church. I don't know if there's... There is. There is. Awesome. <laughs> there's, so there's a, some junior church for, what, up to three? Three to third grade. Okay. You may go at this time. And I'll get your pencil here for you. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. There's children being dismissed out of the service will return before the end of the service as they're making their way out. Two uh, quick announcements. Young adults, uh, no young adult lunch today. Wait till next week uh, for that. And I failed to greet anyone who might be new this morning. We're glad that you are here. We've got a welcome table in the lobby. Love for you to fill out a connection card. Also have a QR code for you to scan in the bulletin if you'd prefer that. Uh, if you have your Bible, you grabbed a bulletin, you got your phone, open, turn, click. We are in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 this morning. Uh, I ask you to do this each week, by the way, in case I ever say anything up here that doesn't match with what you can see with your own eyes. Down there, you will know who to believe. Um, reading the sermon passage this morning is one of our interns, Mitchell Smith. Uh, Mitchell, you can come on out. Mitchell has broken all sorts of molds in his life, not just in terms of height. Uh, he is the very first high school graduate that we have hired as an intern. You just graduated from Odyssey Charter High School, headed to the University of Delaware, where you're majoring in finance, business, something like that. Fourth of your siblings to go to the University of Delaware. Mom and dad went to the University of Delaware. We, you bleed blue and gold. Uh, and uh, You're reading our passage this morning, or did you memorize it? Uh, well, we'll see. Memorize, of course. <laughs> uh, this is Ephesians 4.29. It says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Mitchell. <laughs> to begin the sermon this morning uh, with a statement, uh, kind of a big idea that we've been trying to press into at least for the past year, maybe year and a half as a church. And I'm going to invite you, if you agree with this statement, to say amen uh, when I'm finished. Here's the statement. When Jesus comes into our lives, change happens. Amen. Do, you, do you agree with that? When, when Jesus comes into our lives, 
change happens, all right? When he comes and takes up residence in my heart, uh, there is a change that's worked in my life from the inside out. It's not just an ideology that we believe. It's not just a, a, a mindset change that we have, but there is a deep heart level, a deep life level change that happens. The grace of Jesus meets us where we are, but does not leave us where we are. Um, we reject we reject the lie sold to us in part by nominal Christianity that tends to view Jesus only as a teacher who came to instruct us or as a role model for us to follow. We believe that Jesus is alive today, that the same power who rose Jesus up out of the grave is at work within us. We call that the Holy Spirit. Uh, this is one of the main themes, I believe, one of the main thrusts of Paul's letter to the, uh, to the Ephesians, that, that the gospel, the good news, makes dead people alive, right? Makes us change. Uh, not, not only does, uh, you know... <laughs> The gospel we believe is not just about Jesus dying to take away our sin. That's half of it. That's half of the story. The other half of the story is Jesus died to give us life. He died not only to remove those rags from us, but to give us robes of righteousness. He, he, he died not only to, to deal with that ugliness of my cold, dead, dark heart, but he died to give me a new heart, a new life. We believe that. So let me make this statement one more time, and if you still agree with me, I want you to say amen. When Jesus comes into our lives, we believe change happens. Yes. Amen. Amen. See, I, I think that many of us, myself uh, included, have grown accustomed to a lifeless Christianity, right? A Christianity that rightly remembers the death of Christ, but forgets the resurrection of Christ. Forgets that Jesus rose up out of the grave. Forgets that Jesus is right now seated at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for us, has poured out his Holy Spirit on us. Now, this morning... We come to a very important topic. Uh, this is uh, perhaps one of the greatest, or at the very least, one of the most accessible evidences that we have of Jesus' work in our lives, because we're thinking this morning about words, the words we speak. This is, I want to say, a, one of the most accessible pieces of evidence that Jesus is alive at work in my heart uh, if there's a change in the words that I speak. Uh, Mitchell, you did a fantastic job reading that passage. I'm going to read it one more time because it is so short. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Um, <laughs> my wife asked me last night, said, uh, you know, what are you preaching on uh, in church tomorrow? I said, you know, I'm giving a sermon on, uh, on words, the battle for our words. And she said, you know, didn't we hear a sermon on that a, a couple weeks ago? <laughs> I said, yes, yes. Uh, if you were here just uh, two weeks ago, you know, Pastor uh, Steve Shepard, uh, one of our newest members here, whoo, I just got loud, um, uh, uh, preached a sermon on words when we were uh, discussing what it is that he might come and preach. Uh, the only real guidance I gave him was, hey, let's stay away from any kind of peripheral topics. Let's preach on the, the main thing. He pro preached a sermon on the power of words. And I just love how the Spirit orchestrates these things. Because as we're just following the text, we're just following Ephesians, we naturally come to this section of, of Ephesians where he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. And so I thought about calling this the power of words part two. Uh, but our focus really this morning is the battle. It's the battle for our words, the battle to control uh, our tongue. Um, and indeed, I, th I think this is probably one of the most significant uh, battles that you and I face on a daily basis, in part because we're talking all the time, some of us uh, more than others. <laughs> Let's do a quick survey. Let's, uh, we'll see test your self-awareness. How many of you uh, in your family or in your social circles, wherever you run, you tend to be the chief talker, right? Let's test your self-awareness, time of true confession, look around, see, uh, in your family, in your social circles, you, you tend to be the, the chief uh, talker. You notice my hand uh, is up as, well, they say that women speak more than men. I can tell you that's at least not true in my house. I come home, surprise, surprise, just with words flowing out of my mouth. 
<laughs> I googled this week, how many words do we speak a day? Um, and not surprisingly, Google, the internet, does not agree with itself. Maybe we speak as many as 7,000 words a day. Maybe as many as 20,000 words. Either way, I was thinking about this. If you have a Fitbit, you probably speak more words. More words come out of your mouth than steps you take with your feet. Huh? We speak quite a bit. Uh, one statistic, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. I don't know. One-fifth of our life, somebody said. But they said one-fifth of our life we spend talking. <laughs> that's, like, that's probably more true for some of you than for others. Probably certainly true for me. One thing should be clear, though. We spend a lot of time talking, right? Words are constantly flowing. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking to others. We spend a lot of time maybe talking to God. Uh, many of us probably spend a lot of time talking to ourselves. Uh, I had a seminary professor uh, who made a, a very bold claim. Uh, I still remember it. He says, our lives will be most directed, most influenced by the voice we hear most often. You agree with that? Your life will be most influenced by the person whose voice you hear most often. And then, and then here was the twist. He said, whose voice do you hear most often? Who, who, whose voice is always in your, uh, in your ear? <laughs> it's your own. <laughs> it's your own. And so we need to be, we need to be thinking about the, this corrupting talk in, in all sorts of uh, directions. Uh, Paul's call to us in this verse is a challenging one, isn't it? Let no, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only, only such as is good for, for building up as fits the occasion. Um, in the sermon this morning, I want to share with you four truths, uh, four thoughts, four, four things that we need to affirm if we're going to take serious Paul's command here. If we're, if we're going to take serious uh, this, this picture of what the redeemed life looks like in relation to our words, four things that I think that we need to know, that we need to rest in. Um, so let's get started. Number one. First thing we need to know, uh, we must understand where the real battle takes place. In this battle for our words, in this battle to gain control of our tongues, we need to know where the real battle takes place. Um, a couple weeks ago, I watched a great, what we thought was a war movie, ended up to be not as much of a war movie with my son called Operation Mincemeat. Anyone see that? Ever hear of Operation Mincemeat? I saw one person saw this movie on Netflix. A World War II movie recounts the true story of an elaborate ploy by British intelligence to fool the Germans, that's, uh, you know, the Nazis, into thinking that the Allied forces were going to land in Greece when, in fact, they were going to land uh, in Italy. And so the movie followed, you know, lots of drama, lots of twists and turns. I don't want to ruin the movie for you, but it did happen 80 years ago. Uh, it's like going to the Titanic and not knowing what was going to happen. Uh, the Germans bought it. The Germans bought it. The Germans were convinced that the Allied forces were going to land in, German, uh, in uh, Greece, so they fortified Greece when, in fact, the Allies were going to Italy and they rolled right through Italy. See, we need to know where the real battle takes place place. We need to be sure that we're fighting the right battle. We need to be sure that we're fighting the right battle. Uh, th this is a theme that Paul's actually going to take up a little later on in the letter, isn't it? If you know the flow of Ephesians, you know when we get to Ephesians chapter 6, he says our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, uh, but it's against the rulers, the powers, the principalities of this dark world. It turns out, see, your fight isn't with the politician. Your fight isn't with the government. The, the, Paul says you, the real battle is the, is the rulers, the, the powers, the principalities of this dark world. But as we, as we think this morning about this battle, battle for our tongue, what I want to say is, where is that battle? Yes, there is a spiritually charged nature of that battle, but where is that battle? We're thinking about this battle within us, this battle for our words, and our temptation is to focus this battle simply on our mouth, simply to focus on the words we speak. Now, when we look at our passage, we might think that that is actually Paul's focus. If we look at Ephesians 4.29, he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your Mouths. And so we might think that's where the front line of the battle is. Uh, this is one of those cases where we need to zoom out just a little bit. This is one of the dangers, I think, actually of going so slowly through Ephesians because we forget the greater context. We're in verse 29. But if you have your Bible uh, on your lap, and actually we do have a slide here. If we go back just a few verses, 22 to 24, that was like, I don't know. 
two months ago. Uh, <laughs> we can see the bigger context, the bigger argument, the, the thought that was in Paul's head as he's flushing this out. So Ephesians 4, to 24, he says, you know, you were taught uh, to put off your old self, uh, which belongs to your former manner of life, all that corrupting talk, things flowing out of your mouth and as corrupt through deceitful desires. And here it is. And to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. See, see, what he's saying is there are these external things that we do. This morning we're thinking about the corrupting talk that comes out of our mouths. Well, uh, we've, we've talked about the, the lies that, uh, that we speak or maybe believe as well. We've talked about anger. Uh, last week it was let the thief no longer steal. These are all very external things. But it goes back to this passage right here, verses 23 and 24. What's going on within me? This inner self, this new self, the power uh, to, to live live this new life does, is not found in the externals. In other words, it's found in the internals. It's found on the inside. Uh, Jesus says something very similar. Uh, the, the language is a little different. Let me give you another verse. Luke chapter 6 verse 45. Uh, Jesus says the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what do we, what do we learn? Paul is saying the same thing that Jesus said. Jesus is saying the same thing that Paul said. The battle for our words does not take place in our, with our mouths. It takes place uh, in our hearts. Um, <laughs> this is why uh, sheer will, this is why grit and determination as far as those things might take you in certain areas of your life will not give you victory in this area of your life. It's why we can spend 99.999% of our time controlling our tongue and watching what comes out and then you have one instance of anger, one instance of frustration, one ang instance of impatience and you, you blow up, right? Husband blows up with his wife. Mom blows up at her kids. Boss blows up at work. Uh, siblings blow up at each other. We spent all of that time trying to control our, our, our words, not letting anything come out, and it takes one single moment of weakness for it to come out, and you feel awful. You feel awful that those words came out, and you say, where'd it come from? Where'd it come from? Came from your heart. We need to know, church, where the real battle takes place. Grit, determination, the sheer force of our will can only take us so far. If I could switch analogies just a, just a little bit, you know, I, I think I've told you I grew up in southern Delaware right along the mouth of the, of the Delaware Bay. And uh, we used to grow up and uh, catch fish and crab and you know, it was a wonderful, wonderful childhood uh, growing up down, uh, down there. Now, uh, that was like, what, 30 years ago. Now, now I'm told if you catch any fish that comes out of the Delaware Bay, if it, if it lives in the Delaware Bay, you probably shouldn't eat it <laughs> because, because the water is, is toxic. It's, it's not good. How do, you, how do you go about cleaning up something like the, the bay? You, you don't do that by cleaning up the mouth of the bay, right? You need to go upstream. You need to go to the rivers. You need to go to the tributaries. You need to go higher up or deeper down. The, the problem isn't with the mouth. It's what's behind the mouth. And so we begin with this thought. We need to know where the real battle takes place. And it takes place within my heart. So that's, that's thought number one. Truth number one that we need to know as we engage in this war for our, or this battle for our words. Secondly, we need to understand something of the power of uh, words. And uh, Pastor Steve really helped us out uh, with this part, the power of our words. And uh, I want to say kind of two things in relation to the power of words. First is this, that we need to recognize the power of our words to uh, destroy, right? To uh, tear down. Proverbs uh, 18, 21 reminds us death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, this is actually the first thing that Paul points out when he thinks about words or our, our talk. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. The Greek word that he 
uses here is the word sapros. It's the same word that uh, Jesus used in our Luke verse when he talks about the good tree and the corrupting tree or the bad tree and the, and the good fruit and the bad fruit. Uh, that word sapros could be literally translated overripe. Uh, what's, what's another word for over, overripe? What do you call that? When you have a banana that's sitting out on your counter and it's overripe. It's called rotten and it smells. And no matter what your wife tells you, it's not good for anything. Throw that away. <laughs> it's not fit for use. It's rotten. What is it that makes our words rotten, not fit for use? Let me give you three, um, maybe three categories for corrupting uh, words for you to process this uh, maybe later this week. Uh, category number one would be there, there are corrupting words that are intentionally harmful. We, we, we sometimes, you know it, we speak corrupting words that are intentionally uh, harmful. There are uh, probably every single person sitting here this morning listening at home uh, could tell a story of, of, of some wound that you are carrying, not from uh, sticks and stones, but from words that were spoken to you. Uh, I'm 41 years old. I can still remember being out on the t-ball field when I was five years old. I was playing the great position of a right field, and the ball finally came to me, and I ran to get it, <laughs> and I held it up like a... <laughs> like a trophy. And I remember the entire team yelling at me, throw it, throw it. There's one particular boy, I won't tell you, his first name was Jeff, but because of uh, our online presence, maybe I won't say his last name. His name was Jeff. I remember Jeff getting in my face and calling me names, it's throw the ball, which I did in no particular direction. <laughs> that didn't make Jeff very happy. <laughs> I still remember that. I still remember that 36 years later. We, uh, we, th there are words that are harmful, words that are intentionally hurtful. Uh, uh, let me give you another category. How about this? Boastful words. Boastful words. Uh, words that we speak to, to puff ourselves up. Words that we speak to validate ourselves. We have a word for this right now in our culture. It's called social media. <laughs> Boastful words. Do you speak boastful words? Does that come out of your mouth? Or how about this? Harmful words, boastful words. Last category, reckless words. Reckless words. I idle words. I'm convinced more and more that this is the single most dangerous category for everyone sitting here. Most of us, if you have the Spirit of God within you, you, you're, you, you are attempting not to speak harmful words. And, and you hopefully have some bit of conviction about speaking boastful words. But it is these reckless words, these words that just bubble out of your mouth when you're not paying attention. It's that 0.01% of the time because we can't guard ourselves all the time from the overflow of the heart. So first, as we think about the power of words, we need to be convinced of the power of words to destroy. And then, of course, surprise, surprise, we need to be convinced of the power of words to build up. We believe that words have power. Words have power not only to destroy, but they have power to build up, to construct. We see that in our passage here. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, for construction. Not just destruction, but construction. Words have power power. I'm going to talk about something that was in the news this week, something that was actually, I think, pretty encouraging. Uh, NASA released this week, uh, I've talked to people about this all week, I'm surprised that uh, very few people seem to have seen this. NASA released uh, earlier this week some brand new pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the most powerful telescope in human history that are giving us the deepest view into the universe that the human eye has ever ever seen. It's incredible. It, it's amazing that it's not blowing all of our minds. Maybe it's because my background as a, as a science teacher, I pulled one of those pictures. Yeah, there we go. We have it. Um, let me show you, tell you what you're looking at. Sometime tonight, go outside, find a grain of sand and pick it up and hold it out at arm's length and aim it at the sky. That's how much sky that picture right there is taking up. One little speck of sand. Do you know what you're looking at in this picture right here? Uh, most of those points of lights are not stars, but entire galaxies. Isn't that amazing? No, no human eye pr pr prior to this week has seen so far and so deep into the depth 
of the universe. This is made all the more incredible when we open up those Bibles that are sitting on our laps and go to Genesis chapter 1 and we hear Genesis 1, 14. And God said, let there be light. Let light fill the expanse of the heavens. That's incredible. I hope that gives you goosebumps, that you, that you feel that. That the entire universe that we, we haven't even seen <laughs> came into existence when God spoke. He spoke it into existence. That's incredible. When we continue to read Genesis, we realize that we are made in his image. We are given the capacity for language, for speech. We, too, know something of the power of words. And so we hold on to that. Right? We hold on to that, that, that words not only have the power to, uh, for, you know, for destruction, but they have the power for construction. That's how God has wired the universe. That's how he's wired us. Words have power to build up. Um, Paul gives us three qualifications for these kind of words that build up. These, these kind of, of words that God uses to, to do uh, something constructive. And I'm going to look right at our text and see these three things. The first, uh, first qualification for these words, Paul says they must be good words, but only such as is good for building up. Uh, that word good is the Greek word agathon. We, showed, we, we saw that last week when Paul says, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, let him do honest work or good work. And so the first thing that we, we need to understand about these, these kind of words is that they're, they're good in that they are honest, uh, in that they are full of integrity. We're not called just to share our opinion, but to speak truth. Those words must be good if we are going to build uh, others up. Uh, secondly, uh, we see that Paul says that these words need to fit the occasion. It's, uh, it, needs, it needs to be appropriate uh, for that time and that place. Just because it's true doesn't mean you need to say it. Uh, he, here, here's the problem with many of the words we speak. It's not that they're uh, not appropriate. It's just, um, you, you know, they're spoken. <laughs> uh, you have too many of them. <laughs> You're speak, speaking them to the wrong person. You're speaking them at the wrong time or the wrong uh, place. I've very quickly learned this as a parent of, uh, of, of teenagers. I know the best time to talk to my children it's not after they've gotten home from school and are sitting on the couch watching YouTube, right? It as fits the occasion. Uh, so we, we believe that, uh, that they need to be good. They need to fit the occasion. And here to me is the most uh, encouraging part of this verse, that they may give grace to those who hear. Words that give grace, impart grace. That's incredible. That's incredible. We, we've been talking for, for uh, many months now about trying to become men and women who embody the, the love of Jesus and speak words of, of life, that, that uh, speak words of, of truth, that impart grace. That's what he's saying here. Your words give grace to others. If I could just maybe pull a thread from last week's sermon, we, we were thinking about, remember, good work last week and what makes good work good. We said that we have a contribution to make. You have a contribution to make. You have a role to play that's yours and yours alone, like the, like the disciples who found a couple fish and some loaves of bread and laid it at Jesus' feet, and Jesus used that. You have a contribution to make. And what we find out here is that it's in, that happens not only in relation to work, but it happens in relation to our words, that God uses our words. I hope that like everyone sitting here this morning can point to maybe many instances when there was a word spoken to you, maybe sitting in church Sunday morning, uh, maybe a, a, a word spoken by a friend or a family member that changed your life, right? Can, can you put your finger on some words that were spoken to you that changed your life? Um, <laughs> sometimes the person who spoke it doesn't even realize the significance of it because it's really not about that person. A uh, number of years ago, I was out at my favorite store, 
Home Depot, and uh, standing in a very long line there at Home Depot. And uh, as I was getting closer to the cashier, I was happy to get to the front of the line. It was evident that the cashier was uh, happy to see me. I got to the front of the line, and he says, Yo, Mr. Haynes, how's it going, man? Do you remember me? Now, I taught for only four years in a public school, and I have to confess I don't remember most of my students. This one fortunately had a name tag on because he worked at Home Depot. <laughs> Is it Aaron? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he said, Mr. Haynes, I remember that one lesson you gave over 10 years ago. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> I was a science teacher. I must have given some life lesson to Aaron. Excuses are the tools of the incompetent, but Aaron could point to that standing in the line at Home Depot 10, 15 years later. <laughs> and I can tell you, it has nothing to do with me. Or it has nothing to do with the person who speaks those words. God uses them, right? That's what we believe. God uses those words. God uses our work. God uses our words. He uses our words to impart grace, to build up. It's not about you. It's about the God that we serve. Let me finish with this. In our battle for our words, we need to know, number one, where the real battle takes place. We need to be convinced of the power of words to destroy and to build up. Here's the most important thing I want to leave you with. We rejoice that Jesus has already won the battle. We rejoice that Jesus has already won the battle. We believe that when Jesus comes into our lives, change happens. If we are to win this battle for our words, yes, we need to understand the power of our words to build up and destroy, but we, and, and, and not only do we need to know where the real battle is taking place, but we need to know that Jesus has won the battle. I find too many Christians stop there. They, they, they stop with, I, I, I know it's all about my heart. What you need to hear is Jesus has won that battle. Jesus has given you a new heart. That's the proclamation of the gospel. It's not just enough to know that it, it comes from my heart. I need to know that Jesus has given me a new heart. He's won that battle. I'm moving from a position of victory, not working towards it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> That's the deepest truth that we cling to, that Jesus has already given me a new heart. He has already given me a new self. The path to victory is not found by striving to do better. It is surrender to the one who has already won the battle. A surrender that certainly should lead to repentance. A surrender that should lead to deeper trust. For most of us, a surrender that should lead to action. I'll leave you with this verse. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, with the power of his words, let there be light. Let light shine out of darkness. Has directed that same power into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He's won the battle. When Jesus comes into our lives, we believe change happens. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. We thank you, Jesus, that it is and never has been about us, our strengths, our weaknesses, our sufficiencies, <laughs> our inabilities, but it is about your power at work within us. Lord, we thank you for this gospel promise that, uh, that uh, you know, we, we have this insight that it is about our heart, but we thank you that you've given us that new heart, that we are not working to one day take possession of this new heart, but that it is given to us in Christ Jesus when we bow our knee to you. Lord, we pray that you would help us more and more to surrender, to give our lives more fully over to you, to live out of that reality, to give up this striving that we, that we often do. We, we feel it. I, I feel the weight of, of my careless words in, in particular of, of, of evidence that, uh, that there is still quite a bit of work to be done. But with Jesus, we thank you that you have already won that battle. You have already run the race. You have already gone ahead of us. And so we rest in that. Uh, would you produce fruit in this area, uh, in, in our lives in, in particular, in, in the days and the weeks in, in our life, we pray. Lord Jesus, amen.
Amen. And uh, men, before we take up the uh, the offering, we're going to uh, we're going to call our middle school uh, mission trip uh, students to come, uh, not onto the stage, but just in front of the church here. <coughs> Last week, we commissioned our uh, high school students going to Peru. We have a gang of middle school students going to Camp Arrowhead, somewhere in the far reaches of Pennsylvania, working uh, at a camp with, uh, that serves adults with disabilities, serving as a work crew. So we want to send you out as you participate in this good work that God has given you, praying that God will give you good words to speak. And so church, let's, uh, let's pray and send them out together. If you would just extend your hands and let's pray and ask God to go uh, before them. Father, we thank you uh, for uh, these uh, young men and young women. Thank you for uh, their willingness to, uh, to put things on hold and to be able to serve you in this way. Lord, we pray that your spirit would go uh, before them. Pray that you would give them many divine uh, appointments of uh, uh, folks to uh, to talk to and to, to minister to. Lord, I pray that you would give them uh, a, a deep sense of, of humility uh, and, and serving and giving themselves over to you. Uh, Jesus, would you be exalted not only in what they do, but in how they do it. Build this team. Give strength to the, to the leaders. Uh, go before them. We pray we send them out in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. You may be seated. And at this time, if you'd remain seated as we take up our tithes and offerings.
our living hope. And now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. Amen. Coffee and refreshments here. Go in peace. All right. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, once again, if there's any way uh, that your church can be helpful to you, please uh, reach out. Let us know how we can be praying for you. Let us know how we can come alongside of you. All right. Well, that's it. We'll see you next Sunday.